Hold on a second. Welcome to Feminist Revisions, an emergent model for digital scholarship in libraries, mainly academic libraries. I'm Anne Conquin, and I'm here with three of my colleagues, Miranda Maricini, Caitlin Pollock, and Matt Carruthers. We're all from the University of Michigan Library in Ann Arbor, and we make up what we informally call the Digital Scholarship Hub. We're all presenting from our homes that we share with furry creatures, and you may hear them in the background, so apologies. So we want to start first with a land acknowledgement. The University of Michigan Library acknowledges the university's origins in a land grant from the Anishinaabe, including the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Bodawadami, and the Wyandot peoples. And we further acknowledge that our university stands, like almost all property in the United States, on lands obtained generally in unconscionable ways from Indigenous peoples. Additionally, we recognize the long-standing historical harms and oppressions that libraries and archives have committed as part of colonial practices rooted in white supremacy. Likewise, we want to acknowledge the digital technologies that make meetings and spaces like this possible. And here we're quoting Adrian Wong, a spider web show, a Canadian artist who asks us to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. This technology leaves significant carbon footprints contributing to changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous peoples and many people of color worldwide. I invite you to join me in acknowledging all this, as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. Now I want to turn to the topic of our presentation today and start us off with a broad introduction to our digital scholarship service model at the U of M library and how it was designed. As I mentioned, my name is Anne Conquen, and I'm the digital scholarship strategist at the University of Michigan Library in Ann Arbor. So on this slide here, we have a representation of the digital scholarship service team and our service model at the U of M library. The people who support digital scholarship are organized here into teams that correspond to this hub and spoke model represented on this slide. This model was established in 2019, so yes, we're super new. The core members who make up the hub are here on the panel, the hub is that center circle. We're all full-time librarians who, whose primary job duties are to support digital scholarship in certain capacities. Then we have the larger service team that's represented in that teal, bluish, circle and center, which includes over 20 representatives of our digital repositories and research services, publishing, library operations, IT partners, and the libraries of our sister campuses at Dearborn and Flint. Then the largest circle here in yellow represents our digital scholarship practitioners group of individuals or centers that offer digital scholarship related support, but who may not identify or be officially affiliated with our service. These folks are distributed across the library and campus, and we often connect researchers with these experts. It's that core group in the center, the DS Hub, that meets weekly, triages the majority of the incoming requests, provides initial consultations, hosts office hours, coordinates public programming and workshops, and chairs the subcommittees of the Digital Scholarship Service Team. So I wanna pause and actually backtrack a little bit and talk a little bit about my background and the perspective I bring to this work, especially as someone who transitioned into libraries a little bit later in her career. So on this slide here, I have some images representing highlights in my intellectual and activist work, um, or activist history that inform my work. I identify as a queer feminist Asian American immigrant, and this is an orientation that brought me, brought me to feminist techno science organizations like FemTechNet and FemBot, and to forming feminist critical race and ethnic studies groups like Transformative Digital Humanities, shortened to Transform DH, and the Situated Critical Race and Media Collective, or SCRAM. Within these latter two, we brought these critical lenses informed by critical race and ethnic studies, critical race theory, to digital humanities and media activism. As a scholar, I've long been invested in alleviating precarious labor conditions, distributing power and resources, and in addressing inequities often exacerbated by digital technologies. So in developing a digital scholarship program at U of M, I brought all of these investments to that work. I've also been super fortunate to receive direct support from my supervisors 
and to hire and bring on some amazing folks like the one speaking with me here today who carry out this work every day. They inform their day-to-day -day engagements with faculty, students, and peers with questions of fairness, equity, consent, transparency, accessibility, and power. So I do not take it lightly when I say that this work is a collective effort. And doing so has been a challenge for a number of reasons. At this point, I wanna give us some institutional context about the University of Michigan and the U of M library where we do this work. So it's not surprising that we are a predominantly and historically white institution, and it can be hard to make changes in such institutions. There's lots of bureaucracy, people get used to things working a certain way. And as a top tier R1 research institution, where folks are often preoccupied with research output, this is often done at the expense of equity and fairness. Additionally, our campus is resource rich. Really, there's an embarrassment of riches here, but it's also heavily siloed and support up until now has been piecemeal and uncoordinated. Like many campuses, faculty, students and staff report challenges to identifying, finding and getting access to help or resources. And lastly, the expectations of our faculty at this very research, this rich resource rich institution don't always align with our material reality. By that I mean, remember, our program is really new and we're technically still a pilot. We don't have a budget, we're not a center, and we don't have space. We can't build stuff. Our staff does not include developers or programmers, and we're limited as to what we can host, essentially to services that we already support, like digital collections or online exhibits. And even amongst these, there are exceptions. Um, and though we have in the past supported some large digital projects, these tend to be exceptional projects led by senior tenured faculty with institutional power. And those projects have their own issues related to sustainability and preservation, and of course, equity. So in developing our digital scholarship pilot, we want it to be guided by our values and principles to have a North Star that always helped to orient us in the right direction to balance the needs of our students, faculty, and staff. Three, to use existing infrastructure and technology because again, we have no money. And also to care for our limited staff and their capacity. We wanna not only be equitable, but also sustainable and just. So I was very lucky to be able to hire Caitlin and Miranda in 2019 and to have Matt join our team officially this past year. But there's only four of us and there are a lot of projects we're a huge institution and we're on a lot of committees where we're spread very thin so our solution considering our constraints was to become really good friends with folks in the it shops in the college of literature science and the arts and with research centers on campus this also requires us to be really creative in finding solutions and pushing our organization beyond its usual modes of operation and at other times, it involves taking the time to temper expectations and to undo some bad habits. And these can be really challenging conversations. Ultimately, ours is a values and oriented program. I link here to our principles that guide our work, and we refer to them often, and they're posted publicly on our website. And our program provides the following services. Number one, consultation. This is a regular component of our work in academic libraries, so this is not surprising at all. Two, instruction and teaching support, which Miranda will talk about next. Public programs and workshops, which Caitlin will speak about. And then collaborations with researchers to develop and steward projects and long-term partnerships that involve serious investments of resources. And Matt will speak about these. So at this point, I will turn things over to Miranda. Thanks. Thank you, Anne. So I am Miranda Maricini, and I am the Digital Pedagogy Librarian at the University of Michigan. And I'm going to be talking about two main case studies. The first is teaching with Wikipedia, and the second is our new digital scholarship certificate. So as many of you might know, Wikipedia continues to exclude people of color and women, both as its editors and in its content. And racism on Wikipedia really restricts access to information for millions of people because Wikipedia is one of the most commonly used websites on the internet and an important source of information. 
So to combat this, we organize edit-a-thons in collaboration with students to increase digital representation for marginalized communities. And these have included LGBTQ individuals, women in STEM, Latinx communities, and BIPOC artists in Detroit. That last group was part of Art and Feminism, which is an annual event we hold uh, aimed at imp improving representation for women artists. And we've had a great event in the past, sometimes involving cake and music, but always involving community building activities. So in the classroom, what we also teach students about Wikipedia from a feminist anti-racist perspective by focusing on bias and how we can work towards digital justice by editing Wikipedia. Just in 2020 to 2021, we reached over 150 students remotely and held two public remote edit-a-thons. These edit-a-thons and classroom activities can really help work with colleagues as well because it's an opportunity for all of us to learn together about bias and representation in a real world context. And it's also a low barrier chance for colleagues and students to get involved from home. It works well remotely. It doesn't require much training and it's an easy activity to incorporate in the classroom. So as I mentioned, we've done a couple of edit-a-thons one through a local public library and also art and feminism. And then we did another one with former colleagues um, at another university in Michigan. And when I teach in the classroom, I also co-teach with subject specialists, liaisons who help students learn to find sources in their field. So really this Wikipedia teaching reaches a lot of different people in a lot of different fields, people in science, health science, um, chemist work with a chemistry class, foreign language, English history. So it really helps build community and reach other students in all sorts of fields through digital scholarship. The second thing I'm going to talk about is the digital scholarship certificate, which is a new pilot program. This certificate program comes from feedback from graduate students and faculty who were interested in learning digital skills important to contemporary educators and researchers. It's designed to be a flexible program um, and allows students to work and learn as a small cohort. And it's an extracurricular, non-credit bearing graduate certificate. So you can find out more about it here on our website and look at a syllabus for the program. But mainly it offers two concentrations in research and pedagogy. And the core curriculum is the same for both but the chosen concentration helps students determine what they want to take as elective workshops and what they want to work on as their final project. Some of the main learning outcomes for this certificate are that students will develop an understanding of digital scholarship tools, theories, and methods as they apply to research and pedagogy and develop core competencies in project planning, project conceptualization, and project development. And they will also create professional materials that they'll be able to use in the job search and for career development, which has been very important to our students when we've surveyed them. So as I mentioned, the certificate is designed around six core workshops offered by the library and other university partners. We built the program around our existing DS101 series of workshops, which Caitlin is going to discuss in detail. They cover topics including digital and data literacy, digital humanities research skills, digital pedagogy, and digital professional development. So as I mentioned, all of these are built around programs and workshops we were already doing because sustainability is very important to this program and we only have a limited capacity as Anne was mentioning. So we wanted to keep the program focused on some workshops that we already offered and kind of adapt those for the use in this certificate. And then in addition to those core courses, students can select three or more elective workshops related to their chosen track, research, or pedagogy. So this certificate is open to all University of Michigan graduate students, master students, PhD students, um, in all fields. It uses a cohort model and participants engage with peers and a learning community. We also have a Canvas site that's just for students who are actually enrolled. And at the end of the program, the students will complete a final project. We're very flexible as to what that final project might be. It could be part of a dissertation, 
a report on a work in progress or part of a professional portfolio. So it doesn't necessarily need to be something polished. It can be something that students are working on as part of their research and scholarship already. And we're currently only accepting 10 students for the first cohort. We need to keep the capacity manageable and really ensure that we're able to support every student in the program. We're assessing applications based on how well the applicant's scholarship and teaching aligns with the goals of the program, um, and especially how the applicant's teaching and scholarship speaks to the principles guiding our digital scholarship work. So we really want our values to be present throughout all of our work, and that includes our collaborations with students and researchers. So we are incorporating our feminist and anti-racist principles in all of our partnerships, everything that we do and making them integral to our shared work. And that includes students who are enrolled in this digital scholarship certificate. So that's all I have on that. And I'm, now I'm going to turn it over to Caitlin, who will be talking about programs and workshops. Hi, I'm Caitlin Pollack, the Digital Scholarship Specialist at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor University Library. And today I will be talking about our open workshops and public programming. The goal with our open workshops is to support the research that is currently happening on campus, but also to foster research and encourage the type of partnerships we in the library would like to see and want to model for the university. These are projects where labor is credited, ethics and potential harm considered before embarking, but also aspects as straightforward as coming to us for assistance in an unreasonable time frame. Our open workshops are open to the entire community of University of Michigan, which includes campuses in Ann Arbor, Dearborn, and Flint. Converting our workshops into a virtual format because of the pandemic has actually made our workshops more available and accessible to different UM community members. Like other points you've heard today in our panel, with our workshops, we just don't have the capacity to teach all the workshops we'd like. So we coordinate with our colleagues across the university, which allows us to cultivate relationships across a decentralized campus. <clears throat> One of the best examples of our workshops has been our Digital Scholarship 101 workshop series. The DS101 series is a collaboration with the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, or as we call LSNA, and is co-facilitated co co by myself and Joe Bauer, the Digital Scholarship Research Consultant and LSNA's Technical Services. The workshop series is four to five workshops that cover a range of topics related to digital projects, from conceptualizing and planning a project to digital accessibility and data management. Workshops can be taken as standalones, but are also designed to be a cohesive whole in our scaffolded. Each workshop addresses the values of the series, which includes sustainability, preservation, accessibility, privacy, consent, and pedagogy. We also try to work with our workshop instructors to set up uh, expectations and boundaries for workshop participants. A good example of this is our recording policy. We discuss with workshop instructors about workshops being recorded, and if workshops are recorded, we only record the instructor's presentations and turn off recording for Q&A in order to create a safe community for people to ask questions. Uh, Joe and I also presented on this workshop series at DH 2020, and I've linked to our poster at the top if you wanna learn more about the series. So what is planned for the future of our workshop and our workshop series? We will be doing the DS101 for the second time and folding in feedback we received. We are launching a new workshop series called DIY Digital Scholarship. We're starting to design our workshops to be modular so that we can have a pool of workshops that we can design new series with more agility and flexibility. And uh, particularly around like DS101, uh, Joe and I would like to create a digital scholarship DH pedagogy community around uh, workshops to share materials and expertise. We have an OSF repository for DS101, but fair warning, it does need a bit of updating. Hopefully that will happen soon. 
So on the other side of our um, workshops, we also have public programming. Our public programming looks to widen our audience and usually covers more general topics rather than the topics related to research activities on the campus. Two of our public uh, programming events are Douglas Day and Demystifying Digital Scholarship. Uh, Douglas Day is a national celebration of Frederick Douglass and Black activism and is led by uh, Pennsylvania State University. And we have uh, taken part in Douglas Day since 2019. We like to put a University of Michigan spin on the celebration, like uh, highlighting and using items in our special collections and working with local bakeries, which occurred in both 2019 and 2020, but obviously not in 2021. The events around Douglas Day include art making, music, and community in order to foster um, a sense of being togetherness. Our Demystifying Digital Scholarship uh, event is a regular lecture series with an invited speaker to cover a different topic. Past topics have included text analysis and accessibility, and this year's topic will be digital archives. During what has undoubtedly been a tumultuous and heartbreaking year, and even though we were separated from one another by distance and connecting through a screen, we still wanted to create a shared joyful experience and hold space for one another during, during our open workshops and public programming. And so with that, I wanted to end with some examples from our Douglas Day um, events on the uh, Upper left hand corner, we have our flyer from 2020, um, which shows uh, the activities we did in our in person um, event. And then um, the two other uh, images, the lower left hand corner and on the right side, are examples of the digital art that was made during our virtual Douglas Day celebration in uh, 2021. And these were um, supposed to be kind of Valentine's uh, to notable Black activists. And with that, I'll pass it off to my colleague, um, Matt Carruthers. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Carruthers, Metadata Engagement Librarian, and I'm going to talk to you about our final core initiative, which is Research Project Partnership. So we offer a variety of support for digital scholarship research, which we define very broadly. Uh, across all disciplines on campus to all University of Michigan affiliates and on all three University of Michigan campuses, which includes Ann Arbor, Dearborn, and Flint. Uh, access and equity were really the driving forces and values behind the development of this service. As with nearly all services in the library, we operate on, operate on a non-chargeback model, uh, meaning we don't charge a fee for our services. Uh, and we did this because really only working with researchers who have substantial funding would mean in practice that we would work almost exclusively with tenured or tenure track faculty uh, and the research landscape on our campuses encompasses a lot more than just those individuals so we wanted to make sure that we uh, put together a model that could assist everyone and this more equitable model of supporting digital scholarship allows us to support a greater diversity of scholarship where we currently see silos across departments and colleges that limit who can pursue digital scholarship projects and research. Uh, we're also working closely with campus partners, most notably the Technology Services Division of the College of Literature, Science and the Arts or LSNA for short, to expand services and help break down some of those existing silos. So we have four service levels uh, that we implemented as part of our uh, research project partnerships model. Uh, and they start with basic support and scale up depending on the complexity of the project and the time and effort needed. So the first level is basic consultation. Uh, and that's where we help researchers choose tools, platforms, or methods for their projects. Uh, offer introductory tutorials on using specific tools or engaging with specific processes. We offer both individual meetings uh, as well as open office hours to help facilitate this. Uh, and this represents the majority of consultations that we provide and usually requires just one or maybe two meetings. The next level up from that is what we refer to as extended consultations. And this is where we'll work with researchers over the course of multiple consultations. This might include bringing in other library services, such as consultations specifically around metadata, data workflows, project management, uh, preservation workflows, copyright, 
really any other considerations um, for the projects. The next level up from that we refer to as collaboration. And this level of support is tailored more towards large scale research projects and requires a formal agreement with library staff, usually in the form of a memorandum of understanding that lays out expectations for all parties involved uh, and includes equity driven considerations like guaranteeing appropriate crediting of labor, uh, not just for library staff involvement, but we really try to advocate uh, for all parties involved in the project. So collaborations usually have an extended timeline of months or even years, and often include multiple points of engagement that may include classroom visits, regular meetings with project teams, and more. And the final level uh, of service that we provide is what we call engaged partnerships. And this level of commitment is very selective as it requires a large percentage of our team members' time and effort, uh, and also requires a formal memorandum of understanding from the library. It may include library staff serving as principal investigators on grants, uh, providing long-term technical support, uh, or other roles that are formally written into grant applications. As these partnerships involve multiple levels of approval uh, in the library hierarchy, they may take considerable time to arrange. Uh, and this level is most likely to require additional financial resources like grant funding, as the project would actually be buying out a portion of the staff member's time. So to give you some numbers about how our services have been used, uh, in the last academic year when we have been providing these services in a fully remote environment, we received over 80 requests for consultations, which translated into hundreds of meetings. Uh, over 25 of those requests were faculty projects that we supported, uh, and we assisted or were otherwise involved in 11 separate grant applications. Moving forward, uh, we're hoping to integrate lessons learned from remote work to foster more equitable and accessible services. Uh, and we are also in the process of updating some of our policies, guidelines, and best practices in this area. In addition to adapting to the challenges of the pandemic, uh, national movements for racial justice and increased accountability within libraries and other related institutions made it clear that the team had to address ongoing concerns related to our existing services, uh, namely supporting digital collections and online exhibits, where clear guidelines and policies had not previously existed, uh, particularly with regards to sensitive or challenging content. And as we made the decision, uh, and we also made the decision to uh, prioritize project partnerships, which have a focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and anti-racism. So uh, that's all of the content that we really had for you today. But before we go, uh, we wanted to leave you with a few takeaways. So the first is it really takes a team to commit intentional effort to reinforce our commitments to diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and anti-racism uh, in our digital scholarship service model. Pedagogy support uh, must be multimodal, flexible, and address students at all levels. Uh, and anti-racism must be integral to our teaching. We also try very hard to break down silos and provide equitable and inclusive support for research projects across campus uh, and across all three of our campuses. And uh, the last thing to keep in mind is this is all still very new. Uh, we've only really been doing this since 2019. Uh, and to date, we've been doing most of this work uh, fully remote in a pandemic environment. Uh, so things will definitely continue to evolve and change over time and hopefully, hopefully grow as well. So uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, we really appreciate it. Let us know if you have questions and we look forward to talking to you in the Q&A session.